Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the Grad School of Nursing Hot Topic Session, The Challenges of Home and Hospice Care During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, first, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our event. The event is mainly for the purpose of um, allowing you to, you know, be engaged in a discussion about current um, hot topics as well as meeting our faculty and getting a taste of um, what you might learn in our nursing program in our MSN, our Master of Science in Nursing. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to learn a little bit, meet faculty and ask any questions to the Office of Graduate Admissions should you have any because we are here. So first I'll start by introducing myself um, and Akagi in our office as well as introducing our speaker for today. So my name is Deliz Palenko. I'm a graduate admissions recruiter here at St. Peter's University. And Christy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Christy Macero, Senior Assistant Director of International Admission. Thank you. And uh, next we'll have uh, Michelle Beckford, who's here, who's uh, one of our faculty, and she'll be presenting um, the webinar for today. So without further ado, I'll just have Michelle Beckford introduce herself a little bit and tell us a little more about herself before uh, moving into the program for today. So let me just... Okay, so thank you for inviting me to this presentation. Happy to do it. And hoping to shed some light on what the last year has been like. I wanted to say happy Nurses Day. Yeah. It is Nurses Day. And so I, I celebrate all our nurses. They're all wonderful people. Um, do a great job. Also celebrating the end of 11 years at St. Peter's. Prior to that, I taught at community college. So I'm looking at roughly about 18 years in nursing education. Um, and late in my career came to the clinical specialty of hospice. Prior to that, I was mental health nurse um, for, for most of my career um, and then came into hospice. And I think that hospice suits me well because it requires a lot of um, psychosocial aspects, which comes from my psych and mental health background. And it also certainly encompasses a lot of education, which uh, is also part of my experience. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. My doctorate is in medical humanities. My master's is in psych nursing. So, I hope that you'll enjoy my discussion tonight. I hope that we um, can highlight what the year has been like, and I hope that maybe I can offer um, some strategies from where we are now and things that we can learn going forward to learn from this past year. Okay, so I'm going to put my slides up. That's okay. Challenges that we've faced during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that all of nurses have been challenged over the past year, um, but the homebound population and the terminally ill population is not, has not gotten a lot of the same kind of attention maybe as uh, acute care settings have gotten. Nonetheless, there, there are a lot of challenges to reflect upon and to consider as we go forward, as we progress and hopefully as we look back to what we could do differently. And also I think about um, what we can do in terms of nursing education to prepare our students to you know, be able to practice clinically in such settings. Right. Oh, sorry about that. I was trying to hide that little thing at the bottom, but it didn't work. <laughs> Okay, all right, so I would contend that when we're talking about the terminally ill population, um, we are talking about perhaps the most vulnerable population regardless of a pandemic, all right? And I think that what the pandemic has created has been an increase in invisibility for this particular population. Uh, our patients are mostly either homebound and usually bedbound, or they are nursing homebound. 
and each comes with its unique set of challenges. Of course, some of the things that have happened in nursing homes have gotten a little bit of attention, not as much for people that simply have been discharged from acute care, most of them, to go home with their illness and now have the limitations imposed upon uh, a pandemic that hit us hard and that hit us very unexpectedly. So not to forget that this particular population is completely dependent on caregivers and on their nursing care uh, for all of their activities of daily living, also, um, also for a lot of the times for their nutritional needs. So what happens to them when everything shuts down. That's uh, what we've been looking at, all right? So a big part of this turned into over the past year, isolation and how that has affected patients, families and clinicians, all right? Um, many of our, of our patients are elderly. They thereby sometimes have limited support systems. Sometimes they're going home without any family members that are available to care for them. Some have private caregivers hired to take care of them. Others have family members that are trying to balance their own families, their own jobs, uh, and their own health needs, in addition to providing care for the, the homebound hospice patient. So it's very stressful in the best of situations. Okay. What happened during this pandemic is that people needed to protect themselves. And so people were staying away from the homebound terminally ill population and or keeping others out, out of necessity um, because they're trying to protect themselves and their family members. Some of our patients, a lot of our patients, as you might imagine, have cognitive impairments, things like Alzheimer's disease, things like dementia. Okay, So that's another added layer of stress of trying to care for people with cognitive impairment um, in the midst of a global pandemic where the support team of the hospice team is not able to reach them adequately. This becomes a burden on families and on caretakers. Um, and at the same time, you know, became a quandary as to how do we provide the best needs? Is it at home with limited people being able to come into the home or is it in the nursing home? Whereas we'll see became tinderboxes for the spread of the COVID-19 virus. So all this adding distress, pain, sadness for people trying to care for their loved ones and also such things as um, family members that were in skilled nursing facilities already and changes in visiting procedures and policies. From a bereavement perspective, I'm sure that, that many of you have heard about this, where especially for the terminally ill, they were dying alone or dying with very limited ability to be reached, cared for, touched by either family members or, or caregivers. So for family members, as well as, you know, the patients, very traumatic and difficult. Um, if anybody has experienced a loss during this time, you would know that there's no closure when, they're, when you're not able to be in full contact with the person that dies where you're not able to have the ceremony or the process that you normally would expect to have. Um, also, you know, there's a lot of guilt around this. Um, and also guilt, guilt sometimes 
um, for our patients that do need more services and, you know, if they didn't need to go to a skilled nursing facility or have people brought in, there's guilt all around for what should have been done, what could have been done, what we didn't do, what we did do. So uh, Medicare regulations allowed some flexibility during the past year in terms of visits, right? Um, in terms of nursing visits, home health aid visits, and so forth. Generally, nursing visits are at a minimum one every two weeks, but for the most part, visits happen two times per week. During the height of the pandemic, that was extended to nurses not being required to visit terminally ill patients, but for once every 21 days, once in three weeks. For most of our patients that have difficulty with pain management, different difficulty with cognitive functioning, difficulty with wound care and symptom management, one visit in three weeks is not enough. So how did we compensate? We tried to compensate mostly with phone support, but that's different too, because in that you have somewhat of an indirect contact uh, with the patient and also with the environment that they're in. Likewise, this uh, requirement for PPE, which was thrust upon us, limited our ability to interact in the same way that we would interact if we were not wearing the entire PPE. Um, for example, facial expression. We, we are expecting that our patients and their family members also are wearing face masks at least. Um, also, we're expecting six feet difference, dif distance for family members. Um, and also the way that we would interact with a patient was not to be face on, but to face to the side or from the back in providing patient care, not to be able to face-to-face -face, uh, directly have contact with patient for everybody's safety. Um, and also, you know, with PPE for people that have language barriers, for people that have hearing impairments and so forth, um, added another level of difficulty communicating perhaps. So um, I draw not only upon my own experience, but I try to draw upon what I learned from other nurses and what I've learned from uh, my colleagues that I, I work for. Right? And so there is this deepening sense of wanting to do a good job, wanting to be able to reach the people that are in need while still maintaining safety for themselves and trying to meet the established requirements to provide adequate visits. Um, in the beginning, you know, this was new to everybody. And so the uncertainty was real. So just as a couple of examples of teamwork and situations that we faced, right? Uh, one of our nurses was asked to help with a, a resident that was tested positive for COVID-19, was dying, was alone. Okay. So how do we deal with that? Patient was Jewish. We have a rabbi. How we could best deal with that was to put him on speakerphone and he was able to offer condolences and prayers and support and that patient was able to let go and passed away the next day. I have to say, you know, in nursing homes, yes, we had some testing, some COVID-19 testing for the people that were there. Not so much in the very beginning. The people at home, not much testing, not, not testing at all. And so sometimes you would know if somebody 
was COVID-19 positive, we would know if they came out of acute care hospital, which some of them recently did, they would be tested in the hospital. But if they were already in nursing home or at home, we didn't know, okay? We don't know who is positive, who's not positive. And so in that way, you know, we have to make our best judgment uh, to try to protect everybody the best way that we can, both patients and clinicians um, and those policies evolved and evolved and they're still evolving. Another actual patient, so the story comes from colleagues, mother of a, a large and caring family, but patient was having difficulty breathing. You've seen scenarios like this highlighted by the media on the news. Thankfully, this patient in a facility was on the ground floor. So, the family was able to come to the window outside on the lawn and talk to their loved one through the window. I mean, these, these are unimaginable circumstances for families, for patients, and for the caregivers. But true stories, real life, many months of this. And a third one. So we had a dying patient um, this was also a facility patient. The son was asked to make funeral arrangements to um, come up with the clothing that he would have his mother be buried in. Um, and this was done by a telephone. He wasn't able to go to the store at that time. Of course, everything was closed and he feared for his own safety. So they went into the closets in the facilities and they took pictures of the outfits, the choices that were available to him. And he was able to say yes or no. And that's how they picked out the clothing that this dying person was ultimately buried with. These, these are traumatic kinds of stories true stories that, you know, that family members and clinicians will, will always be affected by. They'll always carry those memories with them. And uh, from one of my colleagues, the response is, I've learned that it's harder to see somebody smile behind a mask, but you can still see the twinkle in their eyes. And that's, you know, how we come to identify people differently because we see them differently and our senses are different when we have to be geared up with um, all of the PPE. So I, I asked a lot of people that I work with about their experiences as well as my own experiences. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we have to look within ourselves and we have to recognize what our strengths are and what our biggest concerns are. And number one, when I talk to people about how it's been, they say, I'm not gonna lie, it was very scary. It's, they've been very afraid. These are the clinicians. So when the clinicians are afraid like that, you can imagine what happens to the person that is sick, the person that is dying, the person that now maybe has COVID-19 on top of a terminal illness, the person that maybe is cognitively impaired has uh, COVID-19 and a terminal illness. So by far, the nurses say that they were so afraid for themselves, their patients, and their families. And I know like Chris Cuomo on CNN has a story like this, but one of my colleagues had this story too, where he lived in the basement for two weeks. He lived in the basement of his home. They would put his food on the, on the steps and then run up and, and shut the door and leave him downstairs. And he wanted it that way because he has an eight-year-old child. At that time, we didn't know how it was affecting children. He wanted to protect his family and most of all, his son above all. And so he had had a fever. He had been working in facilities. He was so scared. The policy at that time was to quarantine and that is what he did. 
be quarantined in his basement for two weeks. In the beginning, we had SWAT teams. Um, and, you know, we were learning. Everything was a learning experience and, and evolving. And so in the beginning, we had our own home care SWAT teams. And what that meant was that for every hospice admission coming out of the hospital, new to hospice, COVID-19 positive, they would be assigned a COVID nursing SWAT team, which would be two nurses. So we had to provide two nurses for every admission that was COVID positive. And the way that worked was that one person would stay outside to document all the findings on the tablet as reported by the nurse that would be inside assessing the patient. Okay, so the nurse that would go inside with the COVID positive patient would uh, communicate via phone to another nurse who was outside um, documenting the admission visit so that less things could be brought into the home and also so that uh, there'd be two people to help with donning and dwarfing all of the PPE equipment and disposing of the equipment properly. Keep in mind, we did this right off the bat with a decreased work, uh, workforce, right off the bat. As soon as this pandemic hit, the agency that I am familiar with has more than 2,000 employees. They were all sent to work from home, go home, not in the office. They're still not back to work. Most of the people that, that um, are not in the field are still not back to work but the people working in the field doing the actual visits, um, they were not allowed to come into the office either, not to get supplies, not to talk to people, not for anything. In addition to that, um, we had an immediate layoff of 100 people over our, our multiple branches. So right off the bat, short staffed. We, um, prior to the pandemic, we had dozens of hospice volunteers that would come into the office headquarters on a weekly basis. They would make phone calls. They would make sure that everybody had their supplies. They would ask um, what they could do to be helpful, whether they needed to speak to a nurse. And those volunteers have not been in the office since March 15th of, of 2020. They're still not back. And so while we, we are starting to uh, open things up a little bit, some things haven't come Back fully as of yet. But nurses, you know, nurses felt the impact of this too, you know, uh, of the immediate changes in, in staffing. Uh, and when you were expected during the height of a pandemic where there were dozens of referrals of COVID-19 patients requiring two nurses for every admission, it was a challenge because that would mean that some nurses were asked to interact face-to-face -face with COVID positive patients multiple times in the day. We had many nurses that got sick, many that tested positive, many that were subjected to quarantine. I think also what was very, very difficult for families, for patients, for caregivers, and also for nurses was that the, the home health aides were immediately pulled from visits. They were no longer doing any visits. So to not have the support person that does the personal care, that does the assistance with meals, um, that can make sure that the patient is adequately cleaned and groomed and bathed was a huge challenge. Uh, rightfully so, families, when the pandemic first began, insisted upon minimal people in the home, minimal nursing visits, no more home health aides, no more chaplains, no more social workers. And, and like our force of nurses and clinicians fell sick or, or were short staffed, same thing as the patient's families and caregivers also 
face their own dilemmas, their own challenges, their own sickness, and their own unavailability. So you can see that that contributed to a lot of isolation for patients. Nursing homes closed their doors, shut tight, including hospice nurses. Hospice nurses were no longer allowed to visit. The only people that were going into the nursing homes were the people that were employed by those facilities. No home health aides from hospice, no nurses, no visits, period. Um, and people didn't really know what was happening. They were scared and they were trying to protect their own organizations, all right? So whatever that may be, think about what the nursing home setting is like. It's very communal. They have multiple people eating in the same rooms, for example. They have people usually in the day room spending time socializing and all of those kind of things. Prime uh, areas for contagion and for spread of the virus. And believe me, this virus ripped through the nursing homes. And so they didn't want more people coming in. They didn't want a lot of attention drawn to it. Um, sometimes they tried to downplay it. Certainly probably they tried to downplay the numbers. They tried to believe that maybe what people were dying of or suddenly sick from were other things like C. diff, anything other than COVID-19. But we saw a director of nursing die at one facility. We saw nurses. We have saw, uh, even in our own organization, um, family members, people just, you know, getting really sick uh, and some of them even passing away. And patients that already had illness or they wouldn't be in the nursing home or they wouldn't be, you know, designated as terminally ill, even not tested maybe, but suddenly showing symptoms and some of them dying very quickly. So well, I would think that one has to ask oneself and I've asked myself a lot, if we're not counting, if we're not testing the homebound hospice population, uh, how do we know that the numbers that are out there and they're horrific, you know, nearly 600,000 deaths from this virus in a, in a little over a year, we didn't even count the people that were homebound hospice patients because they were never tested. Some in the nursing homes eventually were tested. The people at home were not tested. There are some that for certain, we know that COVID played a role. So what to do? Short staffed, unable to get into people's homes, unable to reach them. The best that we were able to do in a lot of situations and particularly our nurse practitioner was able to do telehealth visits, right? So a lot of visits done uh, via FaceTime, smartphones, and, and that's how it went for a period of time. But other factors, you know, I told you SWAT teams for admissions, we no longer were able to have family members come to facilities to sign consent forms for admissions to hospice. That became a big challenge to the extent that Medicare allowed hospice nurses to provide verbal consent. So we would go step-by-step step over the consent forms with the power of attorney or the healthcare proxy for the patient. And then the nurse would fill out all of the consent forms indicating that it was verbal consent from family members. So just one of the technical kinds of difficulties that became more of a challenge. PPE shortages, and, and this to me was astounding right from the beginning, and it took a long time to correct. I was speaking to a friend of mine that was a nurse at a local hospital, and the first time that she told me that they were instructed to reuse their PPE, I, I really was shocked and, and horrified that any agency, especially a hospital, would be directing their staff to reuse the PPE. We've never done that before. 
You never have reused personal protective equipment that's meant to be disposable. So in essence, you know, even the agency that I'm familiar with, they didn't know what to do, right? They also had to protect their agency, right? They couldn't provide adequate personal protective equipment for the same people that they're sending out to deal with the COVID population, right? For simple reasons, like we were told, a box of gloves suddenly cost, you know, six times what it cost before. So they couldn't, they couldn't do it. Okay, so things started being rationed. There were limits placed upon how many gloves you're allowed to have, things like that. So there was hoarding of, of the personal protective equipment. Even where, you know, where the agency that I'm referring to, which is in the nice area, the nurses' cars were being broken into. Why? Not to take the car, not to steal anything that would be of great value, but to take masks and, and PPE. True, true facts. People were breaking in and stealing the PPE. So one of the things that's, you know, become just hard to deal with, I would say, is the changing and evolving policies. And it continues. So it wasn't until recently, just, it was beyond one year where this hoarding of PPE suddenly eased up, and now the agency could make some suitable recommendations about what would be the proper way to protect yourself in even a low-risk COVID situation. So one year into the pandemic, the policy was adjusted to say that we're required to wear an N95 covered by a surgical mask, covered by a face shield. That didn't come to one year into the, this whole pandemic. Right? Um, testing. Testing is another policy that evolved and is still evolving. Initially, they were willing to test you if you wanted to be tested to see if you tested positive for COVID. And then they said, no, we're not going to test everybody that wants to be tested. We'll do random sampling, 10%. Any 10% that we draw out of a hat will be tested on a weekly basis. Uh, but then they realized that uh, field staff had to be tested weekly because nursing homes policies were also evolving and with them not letting people in, they also were not letting people in that weren't showing evidence that they tested COVID negative. In the beginning, uh, quarantining was a big thing. I mentioned before, you know, if you thought you had symptoms or if you tested positive, you were required to quarantine for two weeks. This evolved pretty quickly. We had not enough nurses to um, enforce a quarantine policy where people are gonna be quarantined out for two weeks. And so this evolved into, uh, if you test negative, you can come back to work kind of scenario. And that's where it's at now. We even had people, staff that needed to leave the country in an emergency situation went to Dominican Republic. We had one nurse had to go to Russia. They went and, and they came back and they, they tested back into work. So they didn't quarantine. They tested, tested negative when they came back and they were allowed to come back to work. So that's a look at where we were. Where are we now? Okay, so now the shift is starting to be on vaccines, okay? But keep in mind that the terminally ill homebound patient is not getting vaccinated. Even though they can suffer from COVID-19, they can get sicker, it can affect their illness, they also can spread to other people, but they are not yet in this eligible sort of population to be vaccinated. There's nobody coming into their homes with vaccines to give them. I suppose if they were able to get out into the world, that sure, they could get vaccinated, but that is not the case. And so they are not getting vaccinated. They have opened up um, uh, some pilot programs for the non-terminally ill homebound patient, uh, where people are coming in to 
the homes to give vaccines. It's just a pilot program. It's, it's not a lot of people, but it's a start. Um, if a nurse is exposed now to COVID, at least what I'm familiar with, the policy that I'm familiar with, they're not asking about your vaccine status at all. Why? Because there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy. We have a lot of nurses that don't want to take the vaccine, haven't taken the vaccine. So they're not, it's not mandatory and they're not asking. If you are exposed, I was exposed. If you were exposed, they're asking you, did you follow the PPE policy? And do you have symptoms? I was exposed. Lots of people are exposed. It's not the people that we know that are COVID positive. It's the people that we don't know. So I had a patient that was, yes, she was, I think, 98 years old. She elderly, terminally ill. Okay, dementia. But she was alert, awake, talking, arguing in the morning, going to a five-day respite stay at a nursing facility in the afternoon. She got to the facility, tested positive. What could we do to protect ourselves? We follow the policy, we wear the PPE, and perhaps if it's our choice, we get vaccinated. But it's more often the people that we don't know are positive that then turn out to be positive. They, they, uh, put every, they expose everybody to the risk. But the pendulum also has swung a bit now that vaccines are more prevalent and families are savvy, right? They're, they're, uh, they're different in their demands. So now it's not that they're demanding that nobody comes into the home. Now they are asking, you must show evidence of your vac vaccination. Are you double vaccinated? And I would like to see your card when you're not coming into my home, okay? So this puts constraints on nursing care of patients because as I told you, we have many nurses that are not vaccinated and they're not comfortable revealing their private health information. And so then they're turned away from taking care of those patients. Where we are now, we ask families and patients to wear masks in the home. I've got to tell you, I've seen lots of family members and lots of patients. For the most part, the patients are not wearing masks. Again, a lot of them are cognitively impaired. They have difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. They're not wearing the mask. They're not keeping it on. They're agitated. They're not keeping it on. Um, sometimes we can get family members to keep the masks on. Sometimes we can't. Some of them say, this is my home. I've been vaccinated. I'm not doing it. Okay. Nursing homes. My uh, medical director says that the nursing homes are now decimated with empty beds. They're just filled with empty beds. Some of them 40 or more empty beds because of the large numbers of people that have died because of this pandemic. I mentioned this before, you know, our patients still not quite able to get the vaccine. I can tell you that, you know, we have some ambulatory patients, not a lot, but as a personal experience, family member told me, you know, he was taking care of his elderly mother and he wanted her to be vaccinated. And so she was still somewhat ambulatory, although very confused and at times very agitated. So he loaded her up in the car and took her out to one of these uh, mega sites to get her vaccinated. She would have certainly been eligible for the vaccine given her age and her comorbidities. He stayed in line for 45 minutes before the patient got too agitated and he had to take her back home without the vaccine. Uh, another um, issue that we're having that's new is how we deal with primary diagnoses on death certificates. We have family members that are demanding that their death certificate say that they died from COVID-19, even though we know that they had a terminal illness. And so was COVID-19 the primary cause of their death or was their terminal illness their covid and their primary diagnosis, rather, right? Uh, there's money behind this. The government has said that they will be making payouts of $7,000 for any designated COVID deaths. Some life insurance policies are paying double indemnity 
So like an act of God that we couldn't expect, they will pay double the amount of life insurance if your if your death certificate says that you died from COVID-19. I just came into a case in the last couple of days where the, the family member is a doctor. She made every insistence that it not be Alzheimer's disease on the death certificate as a primary, that they had to have COVID-19 as their primary diagnosis. Uh, so we appealed to the state to change the diagnosis to COVID-19. And we were told in New Jersey, they're not allowing COVID-19 to be the primary diagnosis. So now we have to make another appeal. And the only other way that we can phrase it that will make the family happy is to say that the person died from respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19. I think that there's things to be learned here. Um, and I, I think in some silver lining, there, there are um, ways that we can look at nursing education so that we see what has happened here and what we've experienced and how we could do it differently, right? Well, one thing is the terminally ill. Well, nursing students, especially undergraduates, they don't get a lot of clinical experience in caring for this population. Right? Um, there are some, there are a few, not very many. And the ones right now that are doing it are doing it virtual from office with Zoom meetings. They're not doing actual visits. So I think for nursing education, we need to start looking at the ways in which people die, right? How we comfort people at the end of life. We're all about always doing everything we can to support life and to make things better um, and to improve people's situations and their prognosis. But what happens when they're terminally ill? What is the best that we can do for them? Um, I think we don't get a lot of that, especially in undergraduate nursing. So I think one of the ways that we can do that, one thing that comes to my mind is through simulation. Uh, and I was a coordinator of uh, undergrad simulation for many years in, in different organizations. And I know that um, in simulation it reflects like real life situations in medicine where we're doing everything to try to revive that patient, to resuscitate them, to keep them alive and to keep them going. And to have a patient that dies is almost seen as a failure. Well, maybe we have to look at that differently. Maybe we can challenge nursing students to look at the terminally ill kind of patient and to learn what they can do for them to make them comfortable and how to deal with families and how to deal with death and how to deal with postmortem care because end of life happens in every field of nursing. It's not just in hospice care. And so, you know, I put up lastly, I came across this with these hands, seems appropriate on, on Nurses Day and in the situation that we're in. It's just a poem. It reads, with these hands, I have touched the lives of many. I have touched the sick, the wounded, the sad and sorrowful, the fearful and the angry. I've touched the newly diagnosed, the acute and the chronically ill. I have touched the recovered. I have touched the dying and the departed. I have touched the bereaved. I have touched the lives of patients, families, friends, colleagues, and co-workers. I give hope. With these hands, I communicate care and compassion. I soothe my patient who is in pain. I reassure the anxious that I am close by. I encourage the weak to take a first step. I protect the vulnerable from danger. I give courage. With these hands, I serve to meet human needs of the body, mind, and spirit. I wash his back, his face. I help her brush her teeth. I apply cream to refresh dry feet and hands. I give a slight squeeze to a shoulder and a hold of a hand for a moment. I set down trays, pick up linens, rearrange pillows, turn down beds, pull up blankets. I give comfort. With these hands, I nurse the sick. I administer the medications, place the IV, hang the fluids, reset the beeping pump. I wash and dress, bandage the physical wounds. I acknowledge the emotional wounds. I take temperature, blood pressure, and measurement of pulse each with these hands. I empty a bedpan, clean a patient, restore their dignity. I give respect. With these hands, I give of myself in ways of intention or not. My spirit reaches out to another spirit with a welcoming handshake. My generosity of touch is absorbed. 
by my patient's needs. I feel the richer for it. My strength stabilizes his or her frailty and touching frailty replenishes my gratitude for strength. I affirm our humanity. I do all of these things and more with my hands. My hands are the vessel of my spirit as I help people in need, in need of health, kindness, comfort, compassion, respect, and dignity. With these hands, I offer healing. I thank you for your time. I thank you for listening. It's wonderful, especially on Nurses Day and Nurses Week today. That was yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Lauren O'Hare, our the uh, our dean of the School of Nursing, has joined us <laughs> um, yes. right before we go. Um, but I would like to um, very quickly thank you for joining us. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. I learned so much <laughs> about uh, hospice. It's 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 been a crazy year. Yes, it has. Um, but I appreciate that. Uh, and for those joining us, um, I'm, I hope this was a learning experience for you as well. That's just one of the sort of things that you might be able to expect from our programs, incredibly eye-opening and uh, enlightening lectures. So um, before we move into the Q&A portion, I would like to quickly uh, go over boring logistics of admission requirements for the Master of Science in Nursing, and then I'd like to jump into any questions that our, our attendees may have. So um, just took a quick run through. Uh, first, you'll need an official application, and should you require a link to that application, we would be happy to throw that in the chat for you. Um, in addition to an official application, you'll need a personal statement your official transcripts from all undergraduate and graduate institutions attended it must be sent directly to our office. Um, if, you're if you're sending us an electronic transcript, um, I'll also include our email address in the chat as well so that you know where to send that uh, three letters of recommendation. And you'll have to show proof of your malpractice coverage as well as satisfactory completion of undergraduate statistics and nursing research courses and uh, physical assessment of skills. We, we do accept applications on a rolling basis. And um, the next entry term, I believe, Lauren, do you have a summer entry term by any chance? Yes, okay, perfect. So the next entry term is summer one, which begins May 25th. You're still in time to apply. Um, and then after that, the next entry term is in the fall, which begins September 7th. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop recording. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and then we'll jump into the Q&A after.